Hello, everyone. My name is Alia. I'm the Associate Managing Editor at VentureBeat. Welcome to Low Code No Code Summit. This panel is the do's and don'ts of upskilling and scaling citizen developers across your org. Before we dig in, let's do a quick round of intros. Pete, would you like to start? Good morning. My name is Pete Schaefer. I'm the Director of Information Security with TrackVIA. Hi. My name is Lenka Pinkov, and I'm head of Agile Transformation at the Raiffeisen Bank Czech Republic. I'm also a big fan into new technologies, and I'm software engineer by education. So that's my connection to low-code, no-code. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dali Minkovic. I'm a um, global manager for PMI Citizen Developer, anything related to community engagement and raising the awareness of citizen development practice. Uh, I come with the uh, low-code and no-code background both technical and commercial with over 25 years of experience. Um, so we'll just jump right in with the first question, which is the benefits of low code, no code platforms are well known, but security is one of the reasons why companies may hesitate, might be hesitant to use them or adopt them at a scale across enterprise. Why is that? Uh, Ali, could you start us off, please? Of course, uh, like you said earlier, I mean, the benefits of low code, no code technology nowadays are just absolutely enormous and can't be ignored. And um, I may say that um, probably the adoption of low code and no code technology is not in question nowadays. It's the usage of the low code and no code technology. Let me elaborate on that a little bit. So essentially, um, a vast majority of the enterprises are now using low-code or no-code technology, but they are being used within the IT department scope rather than sits and development. Now, the concern comes from sits and development and security uh, from two sides. One side would be the actual platform itself and the security around that, because most of the platforms nowadays are cloud-based. So there's still some skepticism, as I would say, in the um, in the in the enterprises or on the adoption of these because they're using usually a lot of um, uh, open source libraries for the security so people don't trust what they don't see so they are using the code underneath anyway and they uh, before the companies adopt the low code or no code technology they would probably go through some sort of um, uh, rigorous process of identifying the any sort of potential breaches in that. Uh, looking for the various certification um, on the platform in terms of security and, and kind of penetration testing. Uh, the real challenge comes from uh, security when these platforms are released to sets and development nowadays. And the reason for that is because unless this, these programs or sets and development programs within the organization are governed in the proper way, then uh, obviously the risk of exposing company data, uh, IP, anything of, of, of value to the external world are becoming huge. So I guess throughout this discussion, we're gonna to come to the point where we identify what some of these risks can be and how they can be addressed. But in essence, um, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's in my opinion, uh, one of the biggest challenges now. Yes, I would add that some of the concerns uh, might be also related to governance in that sense, that when real citizen developers, people from organizations develop their applications, and these applications may influence how company is executing their processes, sometimes even really important processes, then there may be a risk of uh, not having a proper business continuity plans in place. Because we create applications by ourselves, we work with them, and then when employees or teams uh, change their jobs or even leave the company, there might not be anyone who would be able to fix it just in case anything goes wrong. And then some process execution activities can be put in risk. And if I could just uh, uh, support some of those comments, I, I, I think Dolly hit it right on the head. There's, there's two aspects. There's looking at it from the uh, cloud platform perspective and not to minimize that, but that's somewhat analogous to any other SaaS platform. Are the correct data protections in place, things of that nature? I think that's fairly straightforward. Uh, but his point of, and Lincoln touched on this as well, governance. How are we using the platform inside an organization? 
Again, a citizen developer is not an application developer by trade, and they're also not a security person by trade. So uh, I may be getting ahead of myself, but what can we as platform providers do to help a citizen developer consider some of the security risks of using the platform? I think a simple example is just access control. Who has access to what types of data? And are we helping the citizen developer be aware that they may have very broad permissions that they've provided that may or may not be appropriate for their use case. All of that is to say, I think there's an educational component, but perhaps some in-product guidance could help as well. If we're abstracting application development, we need to perhaps abstract some of the security processes as well, but they're still there, just perhaps in a simplified um, uh, perspective. Great. Uh, keeping that in mind, for companies looking to scale these platforms across the enterprise, where do you suggest they begin? What is the first step they should take? Uh, and Lenka, could you start us off on that question, please? Yes, thank you for that. This is a this is a really great question because that's basically how you can introduce new technology in your organization and how you can make people familiar with that to set the right governance processes and, uh, you know, make it uh, part of operations. So I will talk from my experience and I would first recommend to let your company get familiar with the platform. Take your time, play, experiment, um, you know, set up the right testing environment for that. So then when you fail and something doesn't work, you don't really impact anything that is, um, you know, that you really need some critical process, let's say. And once you form a group of people, once you form a community of people who exchange your experience and they see value of the platform, then take it to the next level. For instance, I can, uh, I can say that I made my own team, and these are definitely not software developers. I made my own team to create their first app just to have their experience, hands-on experience, so that when we talk about the technology later in the organization, we can say with full credibility, if it's easy, if it's difficult to work with that, what are the possible use cases? We even showcased our first uh, examples on all staff meeting to the company. And then later on, uh, we continued by organizing a hackathon, a two-day event where employees could sign up their ideas and then uh, with help of mentors to put them in practice. This event was a huge success and it really showed the power of local no-code platforms. By this, we created awareness, we brought know-how in the company and we mobilized people in thinking that they can really use this technology to take their ideas and make them reality. Great. Peter, Peter Jolly, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to. I mean, Lenka just touched on a very interesting point about the hackathons. And I mean, that's something that in my experience was also uh, uh, proved the, this enormous value because um, organizations are sitting on, on this enormous pool of talent within the organization. And local and local technology enables this talent to kind of surface and be creative and innovative. And there is nobody better to kind of start these new initiatives within the organizations within uh, rather than um, than people who are not, by definition, professional programmers, because professional programmers will typically do and deliver what business asks for them. A business is sitting on these ideas, and they know best how to create and realize these ideas in real life. Now, in terms of starting, um, I fully agree with Lenka, and that's that's something that's been proven across the board when it comes to implementing sets and development practices uh, across the organizations. You need to start small. You, you can't start on, 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 on a large kind of scale and basically say, all of a sudden, we're all going to be sits and developers and we're going to have thousands of apps. It needs to start with this discovery and experimentation process, you know, and, uh, you know, usually within a single department, then you prove the value, then you polish out the little bits and pieces that are not working, see where you can improve, and then gradually roll it out to other departments until you form this complete practice and strategy around how the sets and development will grow across the organization and what benefits it can bring. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, and then, you know, to support that, I think, I think both the speakers touched on this. 
Um, the citizen development life cycle, it, it has some phases and kind of provides a roadmap for how to scale the use of low code in an organization. And if I tie it back to security, in the discovery phase, you're just trying to get comfortable with the tool doing a hackathon like Linka said. Experimentation is perhaps similar. Right around where you get into adoption, if you haven't already, I would really encourage um, uh, citizen developers to deliberately engage with your IT or your security teams and say, hey, we've been exploring this low code platform. We're really excited about it, but we wanna make sure that we're using it in an appropriate manner. Help us understand some of the security and data implications and um, user access controls. Whatever those concerns or requirements are from your IT or security team, make sure you engage them at least by the adoption stage if not a little bit earlier. But I also understand earlier, perhaps in discovery, you're just trying to get comfortable. Can this tool or approach solve my business problem? So perhaps there's a balance there. Maybe your company culture might affect or influence uh, your timing of when you engage your IT or security teams, um, but certainly do so when you feel like you're comfortable with this, you really wanna start using this and let's make sure we're using the platform in an appropriate manner based on the type of data that we need to process and protect. I just wanted to say that it is absolutely right. It really pays off if you engage your colleagues from IT or security soon enough, even in preparation of the hackathon, uh, the way how we did, or we nominated them as mentors who were assisting teams who mm -hmm. were working on their innovations. Because citizen development, like any other thing, it's supposed to bring business and IT people closer, not to set them apart. Each of these roles have different responsibilities and knowledge. So if we make them work together and share their experience, then we enable business innovation in easy and fast way, like local no local platforms are developed for. And at the same time, we provide enough information and assurance for IT specialists that the intention is not to create shadow IT, but basically just to help solve business issues faster. There's nothing else on this one, then I'll go on to the next one. Uh, so keeping all of that in mind, what kind of guardrails or safety goggles can companies put in place to protect themselves, their data, and their people? Uh, and Dolly, would you start us off with this question, please? Yeah, of course. Well, going back again to my experience and what I've seen in past life, and going back again on what Pete just mentioned about the adoption, uh, that's the stage where you know, before the sets and development initiatives can be adopted within the organization. Uh, this is the stage where I would say organizations need to put a certain kind of governance uh, strategy or whether strategy is the right word or not, I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced, but uh, part of the um, governance strategy is certainly one of the elements of, the, of that governance model that, for, that they should be formed around the sets and development. And what I mean by that is um, there needs to be clear objectives defined, what, what the companies are trying to achieve with the citizen development, who your citizen development will be, um, what departments are going to be involved in this. You know, the tools have to be vetted by the IT departments. How are you going to balance your citizen developers versus the daily job priorities? Because citizen developers are not, uh, citizen development is not a role in my in, in my um, in my eyes, system development is something that helps you do your job better. Um, how you not every application is suitable for system development. How you how you're going to make that selection of the applications, etc. Then once you have that buy-in at on on that top level, and the, the, the strategy is clearly set. Um, I'm a strong supporter of forming what I like to call a, a command center within the organization. Something that's going to be collection of combination of IT people, business people, stakeholders, somebody who's going to set these policies and guidelines because obviously security around all the apps are going to be, uh, you need to make sure that the company policies and guidelines are set, that the, uh, that the, uh, um, where the resources are going to come back, you know, if CD needs some support, et cetera, um, the, the platform management that you're using, regular reporting to the stakeholders so the program continues to form itself, then you would also need to set um, certain enablement um, around the sets and development program in terms of tooling and support and training, 
continuous training and growing of the citizen development community, even community to a certain level. Uh, obviously, citizen development on its own, I would strongly suggest always needs to have an IT involved. IT is um, should be involved in any sets of development initiative, not to the same yeah. capacity as involved in their daily jobs, but in more in the advisory role to make sure that everything falls in place, that the software development lifecycle is followed with sets of development apps. And then, um, like I said, um, I would always, like I said, Lenka mentioned uh, um, earlier, sets of development is, is a great, fantastic concept. And uh, in, in reality, if executed properly, can bring enormous benefit and job satisfaction to people. But at the same time, it can very easily turn into the shadow IT if it's not governed properly. So I would always, before adoption of sets and development, I would definitely recommend um, embrace security first approach across the organization. Make sure that the platform is validated and vetted by the IT. Um, most of the applications that sits in development that I've seen are going to be created on top of the existing data and the core systems like SAP, Oracle Financials, and things like that. So IT needs to make sure that uh, the right access and correct access to the sits and developers is enabled for these APIs. And obviously, before these applications are rolled out, I would uh, definitely recommend that uh, companies need to implement some form of approval process in line with the IT standards and guidelines to ensure that all of these CD created apps um, meet all of these security standards and have continuation kind of long lifespan and maintenance uh, plans in place, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I know that sounded a bit uh, too complex and too much, but I think it's very important uh, <laughs> to mention that uh, there's a lot of things to consider um, before uh, moving on to the next uh, maturity. Um, stage uh, in, in adopting sets and development within the organization. Linka, I think you've scaled some citizen development programs uh, in, in a large organization. Perhaps you could uh, uh, add some additional context. Well, I have to say that everything that Dali said, it was very extensive. Uh, I would just add uh, a little thing. Uh, the practice that we follow is that we build um, smaller groups of people we call them centers of expertise uh, we have global center of expertise uh, for citizen development that takes care about global security policies that needs to be in place and then we also try to set up local uh, centers of expertise of local specialists who can help uh, business teams or citizens uh, in our uh, local banks to implement the solutions properly uh, because I believe that when it comes to citizen development and the original concept, uh, which means you give really powerful tools in hands of people who can use them by themselves, then it's really critical to balance centralized decision-making or centralized governance versus uh, enough freedom and empowerment to really use these tools for innovation. So if you make the rules too tough, you might discourage people to even try because they say, wow, I have a brilliant idea, but still I cannot really move forward. If you set the rules to lose, you are risking exactly, Pete, like you said, that um, you know people who are not developers, they may underestimate some risks associated with their applications. Mm -hmm. So I think the key is really to, to find a way to create that balance. And for that, I would definitely recommend to use different types of tools to set up communities in your company, communities of people who can instantly exchange their points, ideas, questions, and you leverage that knowledge from individuals into this community so that they can check up on each other. Like, how did you solve this in your country? What did you do this? Does anyone have experience with that? Did it work? Did it fail? You know, to create this collective knowledge to implement it properly. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, and, and both of you, I think, made great points um, in terms of you need a, some kind of a, a center of competency or a group that is helping to provide some guidance for your citizen developer community. Um, and, and I'm thinking in, in larger organizations, I think that very much makes sense. And I'm also thinking about what about in smaller organizations where maybe they're just not quite that, I'll just say, sophisticated 
uh, in their overarching governance. Um, but perhaps an element there that could help is um, is education. Um, how can a citizen developer, or a, I should say a small company who's wanting to use citizen development, who doesn't necessarily have some of the governance structures that we're talking about, still help their citizen developers understand the types of risk or the types of data that is being manipulated or the reasons that we even have some of these security controls. It's not uncommon for a, an, an end user to just think that security is an impediment to getting their job done. Uh, and once they have the freedom to use a citizen developer tool, may consciously or subconsciously just kind of put the security concerns to the side because they've been like I said, an impediment. Um, perhaps there's an educational element there. I'm not sure if that's education within the platform or something we as vendors can do, or if it's more of um, the citizen development community. I'm just saying, I think there is an educational component to help a citizen developer understand the basics of security and why it's needed. And while it may be overly burdensome in your organization, there's still a level of security that is, in fact, appropriate, even within a citizen development application that you're developing. I'm not sure of the exact answer there. I think that topic might need some more exploration, perhaps. You're absolutely right, Pete. I, and I fully agree with what both of you said. It will always depend on it will also depend on the industry where citizen developers are being born, because some, some of them are a bit more rigorous, like banking, government, you know. Uh, justice systems and things like that, whereas the smaller companies with not so, you know, they may not necessarily have to go to this great expense that I mentioned earlier, you know, in creating these mm -hmm. government strategies and centers of excellence or whichever way you want to call it, I guess. But um, there's always, I think it's very important to always make people aware about the security risks that uh, your sets of development can potentially cause and how they can be managed. And uh, that comes through the education, and I fully agree. And uh, We've seen this uh, through um, through people who have taken our courses at BMI about citizen development and how these risks are mitigated, how to be careful, how to, you know, um, manage these risks. And um, But going back to Lenka's point, you always have to create that balance about not shutting down that innovation because that's what right. citizen development is all about. If there are too many restrictions and too many kind of guardrails around the citizen development initiative within the organization, it will never work. You will not, you might get lots of apps, but they will be very much what business wants, what business needs, as opposed to creating, creating that in innovation element, I guess, um, when it comes to the talent pool. Yeah. Great point. Balance, security, risk, innovation speed of, of providing a solution. Uh, you know, we use the word balance and yet it, it's not necessarily an obvious um, uh, way to achieve that balance. It's very much organizational or contextual specific, but uh, it, it's a great word. The hard part is how do you understand what that balance is and even get, um, I'll say, agreement on, on what that balance should be? I, I think what might help here is when you look at applications, I'm oh, sorry, that's now a mix of words. So application of your application, right? So as long as you stay within the safe zone, for instance, application that you use within your own team, your department, you don't use any external data and you don't impact any business important processes, you are more or less fine. And here I would recommend to put your rules really on minimum, not to block people from their thinking and innovation. But further you go, for instance, then you need to use data either from external sources or even uh, publish your data somewhere externally or you touch the criticality of processes, then rules must be there. And I just wanted to share with you one example how innovation works. On this hackathon that I mentioned, we had there uh, two uh, prizes for two winning teams. And the one winner of the hackathon was a team who improved really, really, I have to say, painful internal process. And it was a very nice win. But then we had a winning team who won by voting by our employees who were part of the event. And surprisingly, it had nothing to do with improvement of processes or work with data. The, this winning team, they created application for engagement and for uh, creating a place 
where people can exchange or sell things and donate to charity. So for mm. ESG cause. And that was amazing because this type of applications, they would probably never make a list of IT priorities or business priorities. And this team, this winning team, they created it from within one and a half a day. And they were promised that it will go live. This is where we need to enable that innovation, not to use technology, only to improve something that we did not figure out properly before, you know, fix some data transfers, etc. but really give something in hands of people who have good ideas and that they cannot wait for priorities of funding because it's not business critical. But they have a great idea that can really improve culture and well-being of people in the organization. And for them, I would go for minimal rules. You have idea. Go for it. Unfortunately, we are out of time, but thank you so much for this amazing conversation and for participating in Low Code, No Code Summit. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to participate. Thank you. It was great to be here.